بسم الله الرحمن الله صلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين. There will be landslides as a sign of the hour. Tell me someone what a landslide is. Yes, sir. Off the mountain, and it a bunch of things. Wow, good job. So that's something of, of the landslide where the dirt comes off of a mountain and may destroy things. Also, when the ground opens up and things sink into it, and a sinkhole of sorts. You can look it up even on YouTube. You can see everything on YouTube these days. You can see what I can't, just to give you an idea what a landslide looks like. And it's pretty scary. I mean, it is the equivalent of we're sitting here together and then the ground opens and we fall in, all of us. I'll summon Allah. May Allah keep us safe from that. But that's imagine how un how unexpected that would be, right? That you were sitting here and then the ground opens and we all fall inside. May Allah save us. But that what is that's basic. That's the basic understanding of a landslide and the ground opening up. Hudayfa ibn Usaid al-Ghifari said that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam looked out over us when we were talking, and he said, "What are you talking about?" They said, "We are talking about the hour." He said, "It will never come until you see ten signs." He mentioned the smoke, the dajjal, the beasts, the rising of the sun from its place of setting. The descent of Jesus, the son of Mary, or Isa ibn Maryam, Ya'juj and Ma'juj have three landslides. He said, one in the east, one in the west, and one in the Arabian Peninsula, which is the Arabian Peninsula is mm -hmm. almost, what is a peninsula? Well, it's an it's a area of land It's an area of land surrounded by water on two sides. Good job. Allah oh, Akbar. My kids are studying in school. Allah oh, Akbar. It is an area of land surrounded by water on three sides, so it's almost an island. It is one side short of an island. So that's why we call the Arabian Peninsula that, because it's surrounded by water on three sides. Now, and he then said, and the last of that will be a fire which will come from Yemen and drive the people toward Asham. We'll discuss that inshallah later. And some reports the specific place and calls of one of the landslides are mentioned, or uh, one of the major landslides are mentioned, which is the landslide that will occur in the Arabian Peninsula. As for the one that happens in the east and the west, there is obviously uh, apparently no particular hadith to let us know what that will look like or where it will happen and so forth. Maybe because it's significant. Well, yani, it has significance generally, but it's not as significant as the Arabian Peninsula. Landslide, and we're going to discuss that here. Um Salama, radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, There will be a dispute following the death of a caliph, and a man from Medina will go out fleeing to Mecca. He will run to Mecca from Medina. Some of the people of Mecca will come to him and bring him out against his will, and they will swear allegiance to him between the corner, meaning the black stone, and the maqam of Ibrahim. An army will be sent against him from Syria, which will be swallowed up by the earth at Al Bayda. And Al Bayda is an area between Mecca and is an area between Mecca and Medina. And then he said, When the people see that the devoted worshippers, the really good Muslims and believers from Syria and the best of the people from Iraq will come to him and swear allegiance to him. And that's where he will rule over the Muslims and unite the Muslims. So, the, the, this hadith mentions that specific landslide, that al bayda when this army comes against him from Syria, it will be swallowed up. And in the other hadith that we mentioned about the Mahdi himself, we mentioned that there will be one of the Quraysh that will fight against the Mahdi and his supporters, and that person will be defeated. So the Mahdi will defeat, and his forces will defeat that Qurayshi member, and then people will understand really, and be able to see that the Mahdi has come, and then they will 
pledge their allegiance to him, and he will unite them, and he will lead them against the fight. And he will lead them in the fight against the Dajjal. There are other hadith that speak about a landslide as a punishment for sin. In fact, I want you to go and look, look up landslides on YouTube. You see people, for example, and I saw for one example, a group of people in a nightclub dancing and stuff like that, and partying, and, and, and all of a sudden, the ground caved in, and most of the people in the party fell inside. It was yani, recorded. That was scary. And these, these, this is a form of punishment. May Allah save us from it. Abu Umama said that the Prophet ﷺ said, Some people of this Ummah will stay up at night, eating and drinking and being entertained. Then in the morning, they will have been transformed into pigs, and the land will be made to swallow up some tribes of them along with their houses. So their houses will be swallowed up in the ground themselves. In the morning, the people will say, the tribe of so-and-so was swallowed up by the earth last night. The house of so-and-so was swallowed up by the earth last night. Stones will then be sent raining down on these individuals who are narrating what happened in the news. And a devastating wind, a really strong, destructive wind will blow them away. As those who came before them, يعني, that means that the wind will destroy them as it destroyed the previous nations, like Ad and Thamud and so forth. He then said, it will destroy them and, and, and blow them away as those were blown away before them because of the drinking of alcohol, the consuming of riba, usury or interest and so forth, the wearing of silk and keeping singing girls and severing the ties of kinship. This lets you know that it's because of our sins, may Allah save us from the evil of our sins, and the evil outcome, evil consequences of our sins. The sins will cause a group of people or a person to be destroyed. The sins will cause a group of people or a person to be destroyed. I was watching uh, another video that was sent to me, there was a man who, in some place, he decided to vandalize the masjid. So, when he did that, he was breaking the windows and stuff, and it was all on video. Some of you probably saw this. No, where are you going? Okay, I'll see you later. He said, so this person was breaking the windows of the masjid. And then somebody came to him and confronted him. So, you know, he acted like he wanted to fight the guy, and then he delayed a little bit, and he started running across the street. And as he ran across the street, the car came and hit him. As he ran across the street, he got up to the other side, the car came, hit him. I mean, it wasn't very graphic, alhamdulillah, like he didn't burst into pieces, alhamdulillah. I don't know if he died or whatever, but hopefully he's safe and sound, and hopefully he will accept the snap. I don't know, but the video showed that he was hit by this car and he kind of fell on his head. He most likely was at least knocked out from that. And just two seconds ago, he was breaking the windows of the mischief. And it's amazing how he was delayed. I mean, he delayed himself. All of that was perfect just so he can be blindsided by this, I mean, blindsided from seeing this car and hit by the car. But none of us should feel safe that Allah will not take us to account for something that we've done. I should not feel safe. Nor should any Muslim or believer feel safe. Any Muslim or Muslim feel safe from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's punishment. Allah said, Wala ya'manu makra Allahi illa qawmul khasirun. Only the losers feel safe from Allah's punishment. Yani from Allah's plot against them. Only losers do. But obviously then winners, the successful people, are worried that Allah may punish them and take them for any sin at any moment. And then they balance that worry out with hope that Allah will accept some of their good deeds and make up for the bad that they did. You see? So these people will be turned into pigs and their houses and themselves will be swallowed up. And in the morning, the others that remain will be, will have instead of rain, stones. 
and a wind will come by and blow them away. So it's not a simple issue. Excuse me. It is a very important issue that we should give importance to, that we stay away from sins and know that Allah can take us at any moment. Another example, Ibn Umar عنه, said that the Prophet وسلم, said, Among my ummah will be some who will be swallowed by the earth and some will be transformed and others will be pelted by stones. Meaning that they will, instead of rain coming down, stones will fall from the sky and finish them. Ibn Umar عنه, also said that the Prophet وسلم, said, while a man was walking and he was dragging his izar, his lower garment, out of pride, while he was doing that, he was swallowed up by the earth. And he suddenly fell into the earth. And he will continue sinking into the earth until the day of rain. It's a punishment. It's an evidence that that is a punishment. Because he was being arrogant. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not accept from me, nor you all, to be arrogant at all. Because superiority is for who? Who was superior? <coughs> Allah. I wanted more people to answer that question. Right now. Think about it. The only one that has a right to superiority is what? Is who? Allah. He has a right. Why? Because he actually is superior. And the only thing that makes us superior is if we follow what Allah says. But then that does not make a person, for example, with this irtikaf and reads one juz of the Quran every day and prays a lot and prays a lot of taraweeh and they think that, or prays a lot of, for example, qiyamul layl, gives a lot of sadaqah so they feel like I'm closer to Allah and that person right there is not as close to Allah than I am. So you start to look down on that person. Give them a hard time. You might not want to shake their hand. You give them salam. You kind of like doing it like through your teeth. You know, hardly doing the salam. You don't want to see that person. Religion does religiosity does should not make you arrogant. Because if a religious person becomes arrogant, then they have done something. That's a crime. That started iblis on his path. Right? He was a worshiper. And that's a, that was a crime that that man, of the, the Israelite man from Banu Israel, when he walked by his neighbor, and he kept seeing his neighbor doing evil deeds, and he told his neighbor, don't do those things. And his neighbor continued on doing it, and continued doing it, until one day he saw him and he said, Allah will never forgive you. <coughs> and that's when he made the mistake. Yeah, his, his neighbor was doing sin. That's one thing. But when he thought that he can determine who Allah will forgive and who he will not forgive, then he made a greater mistake than that individual. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Man عليه, who, who is that that has the audacity to say that I will forgive so and so? And then Allah said to him, I have forgiven him, meaning your neighbor, and all of your good deeds are gone. Ahbaktu amalak means I've canceled all of your deeds. Right? That's where the arrogance gets you. That, to that extent, that's how evil arrogance is in itself. We ask that Allah make us humble. All of us. So this person was swallowed up by the earth because of his arrogance. It was narrated also that Anas, excuse me, Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu anhu narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said to him, O Anas, the people will establish cities and one of them will be called Al-Basra or Al-Busayra. If you pass by it or enter it, then be aware of, yani stay away from the salt flat. Where you find the salt flat earth, stay away from its riverbanks and stay away from its marketplaces. And stay away from the gates or the doors of its governors. Right? The doors of its governors, the people who administer it. And he said you should keep to the outskirts of the, that area. Because there will be landslides. 
and stones will fall from heaven upon such an area. And the people will spend the night, meaning they will be at night as human beings, and in the morning they would have become monkeys and pigs. Yes, Allah who made you a human can turn you and I to whatever you want. Right? Man, may Allah save us. It's going to get scary. No. Nafir, Mawla ibn Umar. Nafir, who was the freed slave of ibn Umar. And Nafir was a scholar. Nafir was what? A scholar. He used to be a slave, right? And ibn Umar freed him from slavery, but he continued to live near ibn Umar and seek knowledge from him until he became a scholar. And he said that ibn Umar was approached by a man. <coughs> and this man said to him, this group of people, this group of people, so-and-so send salam to you. Then he said, I've heard that that inter individual introduced innovations. Bid'ahs. That individual introduced innovations into Islam. If he did introduce innovations, then do not convey my salam back to him. Because I heard the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, they will be among my ummah, or among this ummah, transformations, meaning of people into animals, like the pigs and the monkeys that were mentioned in the other hadith, landslides, and stones rained on individuals from the sky. And Ibn Umar thought, and he believed that that is about the people of Qadr. People of Qadr means those people who believed that there was no such thing as destiny. And that belief was an, is an innovation in Islam. Because destiny is a part of our belief. Right? The last pillar of Iman is what? <laughs> Naam? Faith. faith in what? Our last pillar of faith is what? The sixth pillar of faith. Faith in destiny. Faith in, faith in, good job. So the day of judgment is number five. Right? Number six is faith in destiny. Destiny, meaning things will happen as Allah decreed it. So to disbelieve in destiny is an innovation. Right? And the people say, no, this sort of thing. And they try to rationalize that destiny doesn't exist. But it does. Allah knows exactly what's going to happen as he knows that I'm sitting here and you're sitting there. And he knows the light as it's moving. He knows every single atom that's floating around this place. He knows it. He knows what we think and he knows what we're going to do after we finish from here. And he knows whether or not we're going to wake up in the morning. Right? Allah knows that. And he wrote it. So the intelligent person will try to do good deeds to ensure that they are written as a good individual. The intelligent person is going to say, you know what? If Allah already wrote things and they're going to definitely happen, then I'm going to make sure I do good deeds. So I fit and I'm included in the group of people who do good and go to paradise. Some people say, well, since it's been written for me, I'm, I'm just not going to do anything. You know, it's been, my feather is already written. I'm going to paradise or not. So if I'm going to paradise, I don't, you know, I'm going to sit down. And if I'm going to hell, there's nothing I can do about it. So I'm going to sit down. How does both of them mean sit down? Both of them means do nothing. So if you're going to Jannah, I don't got to work for it because Allah already read it for, wrote it for me. I'm going to sit here. And then if I'm going to hell, well, I might as well not even try to get out of hell. Isn't the, isn't the intelligent person the one who says, if Allah written me to go to hell, yeah, I'm going to beg Allah to put me in Jannah instead. If Allah wrote you, wrote you go to hell, you say, Allah, please, 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 I want to go to Jannah instead. So you try your best to do good deeds. But the point about the other issue is try your best to do good deeds. Yes, you're going to make mistakes today, tomorrow, the day after that, every day of your life. You're going to make mistakes. But you ask Allah to forgive you. And Allah will definitely forgive you. He has no problem with forgiving you. None. In fact, He wants to forgive me and you. So that is it about the sky, excuse me, the landslides. Any questions before we move on? Yeah, these are all fairly relatively short comparison to everything else. Yes.
that we discussed. Landslides. The city you mentioned, so is it about a particular city or in general all the cities? It was about that city, that city in particular. And, and, what he, and he meant, uh, of course he said, stay away from the salt, <coughs> salt, uh, mean the salt area, land, as well as riverbanks, as well as the doors of governors there, meaning the doors of the oppressive uh, administrators. Because he said that people will be punished in that area, so you want to be careful. And if it is Basra of Iraq, Allah knows best. I mean, maybe. Or maybe it's somewhere else. No, I hope that answers your question. Any other questions before we continue? What's landslide in here? Landslide is khas. Khas. Khasinfa? Khasinfa. Wait, the next one is the smoke. There will be a smoke that will appear. Allah said, فَارْتَقِبَ يَوْمَ يَأْتِ السَّمَاءُ يَوْمَ تَأْتِ السَّمَاءُ بِدُخَانٍ مُّبِينٍ يَغْشَ النَّاسَ هَذَا عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ رَبَّنَا اكْشِفْ عَنَّا الْعَذَابَ إِنَّا مُؤْمِنُونَ أَنَّا لَهُمُ الذِّكْرَى وَقَدْ جَاءَهُمْ رَسُولٌ مُّبِينٌ Allah said, then wait for the day when the sky will bring forth a visible smoke that will cover the people. This is a painful torment. They will say, oh, our Lord, Remove the torment from us because we will be believers if you do. And Allah responds, how can there be, how can they come to their senses now and realize it when the messenger had already come explaining to them clearly what they needed to know. Right? So you believe now but the before, when the Prophet explained to you and I, clearly, we disbelieve. And then the punishment comes down, we believe, and that's what happens. Unfortunately, you find, you read about Ad and Thamud and so forth, you find that they expressed belief, but after the punishment started. When just a few days ago, all they had to do was say, I believe in Allah, and I believe in Salih as the Messenger. Right? Or I believe in Allah, and I believe in Hud or Yunus as the Messenger, and so forth. <coughs> Now, scholars differ about what the smoke is. So some believe that it is the smoke that happened to Quraysh when Rasulullah made dua against them to suffer a famine. And they, or they had a drought. Very, it was very difficult for them to eat food. In fact, they started to eat dead bodies, and dead carcasses dead animals and so forth. And they had, they saw something above them that was like smoke. So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was one of those who heard, held this view that this dukhan or this smoke refers to what happened to Quraysh. In fact, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was sitting with a group of people and a man came to him and he said, Oh Ab Abu Abdul Rahman, there's a storyteller by the gates of Kinda who was telling stories. He claims that when the sign of a duhan comes, which is the smoke, it will take the souls of the disbelievers and it will give the believers something like a cold, like having a cold. So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud sat up angrily and he said, O oh people, fear Allah. Whoever of you knows something, then let him say what he knows. And whoever of you doesn't know something, then let him say, Allahu A'lam, Allah knows best. For it is a greater sign of knowledge for one of you to say when he doesn't know that Allah knows best. And then he said, Allah may be he glorified, may he be glorified and exalted, said to the Prophet, Qul ma as'alukum alayhi min ajlin wa ma ana min al-mutakallifin. Tell them, Muhammad, I don't ask you any wage for what I do, nor am I of those who are mutakallifun, those who try to fabricate things and come to conclusions with no knowledge. May Allah save us. When the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw the people turning away from him, he said, Oh Allah, seven years like the seven years of Yusuf. What are the seven years of Yusuf? 
Seven years. Yes. Uh, seven years ago, uh, the, the, when the drought came to, uh, when the drought. Good job. And what happened? It was like when large cows would be Good job. Large cows and small cows, right? Yeah, there would be like big and small cows. Good job. So green grass and dry grass. That was all the dream, right? Mm -hmm. That was a dream that the king saw, and then he explained that dream to Yusuf, and Yusuf said that that's seven years of famine. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made dua against Quraysh. Yeah, Allah, give them seven years. Why? Because they kept turning away from the, this religion, and they kept trying to harm the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa and his sahaba by fighting them and doing stuff and doing So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made dua against them so they can learn a lesson. And then that famine occurred. And they were forced to eat anything. Even as we said, animal skins, the skin of animals, and dead animal meat. They were forced to eat it because they didn't have anything. Rasulullah made dua against them. So my question, did they stay like that? And then Quraysh were like finished off? Or what happened? What happened? Did they stay like starving for 70 years? What happened? Who knows? So what happened was Quraysh then asked Rasulullah to ask Allah to take that famine away from them. And he did, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But once he fulfilled the part of the bargain, which is to ask Allah to take the famine away from them, they did not fulfill their part of the bargain, which is to believe in him as the messenger. And they continued to fight against him. But he still made dua that Allah relieved them, and Allah did. So, some scholars are under the belief that that is the smoke. But the majority opinion, and I want to join between those opinions here. The majority opinion is that the smoke is something that will happen before the day of judgment. And the evidence of that is Ali, Ali ibn Ma'am is that the evidence of that is that Ibn Mas'ud used to say there are two smokes one of which the, the first one has already happened which is the, the smoke that hit Quraysh and the other one that happens or will happen will fill the area between the heavens and the earth and the disbeliever will fill because of it he will fill mucus gathering and possibly you know, in his nose and so forth and probably spitting and so forth but the disbeliever will be pen penetrated in his ears by the smoke right and it, of course it was not going to be a pleasant experience And some of the hadith about that is that Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looked out over us when we were talking and he said, what are you all talking about? They said, we are talking about the hour. And he said, it will never come until you see ten signs. And he mentioned the smoke and the dajjal. He mentioned the smoke as one of the signs of the hour. Abu Huraira also narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, really, Everybody should hasten, should be very urgent in their doing of good deeds before six things happen. He said the rising of the sun from the west, from its place of setting, the smoke, the the, 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 the beast, and the death of someone. And then he said, and before the day of resurrection. So there are six things that you and I should try our best to race against. You're racing against the rising of the sun from the west. You're racing against the appearance of the Dajjal. You're racing against the appearance of the beast. You're racing against death. You and I are racing against death. And we're racing against the day of judgment. We're trying to do as much as we can from good deeds before any of these six things happen. In fact, Abdullah ibn Abi Mulaika said that I went in the morning one day to Ibn Abbas and he said, I could not sleep at, at last night at all. I could not sleep and when the morning came, I still hadn't slept. Abdullah said, why? He said that the people said that a comet appeared. A comet appeared, like a shooting star came 
and I feared that the smoke had began or begun, so I could not sleep until the morning came. See, the Sahaba, when these things happened, they were really afraid. Just like when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam talked to them about the Dajjal, and they were so afraid, and Umar radiallahu anhu thought that the Dajjal might be like hiding in the bushes or something. Now you get somebody so afraid that every little sound makes you go off. You, know, you probably have seen scary movies and then you hear creaking in the back, or wind blowing, and you start to get antsy. So that's how Rasulullah was giving them the story of the Dajjal until they were so afraid. And they were affected by many of these things. We asked Allah to give us that same effect. Last but not least, before we, before we continue, uh, do we have any questions on the smoke? From our sisters, yes sir. Like, so is it going to be like just cover up the, like, the sky or is it going to come up from the ground? It's going to cover up between the sky and the earth. Okay. It's going to be smoke. So if you can imagine, like, <clears throat> probably the closest thing we've seen to it is fog. Uh -huh. Fog, like you know, it's foggy, that's like, you know, that kind of type of idea. So you can imagine that it's not going to be pleasant. Even for the believer, you're going to have mucus and all of this and that from this moon. I'm going to talk about the beast, the emergence of the beast. Allah said, وَإِذَا وَقَعَ الْقَوْلَ عَلَيْهِمْ أَخْرَجْنَا لَهُمْ دَابَةً مِنَ الْأَرْضِ تُكَلِّمُهُمْ أَنَّ النَّاسَ كَانُوا بِآيَاتِنَا لَا يُقِنُونَ Allah said, when the word of torment is fulfilled against them, when that is fulfilled, that statement is fulfilled, Allah will bring out a beast from the earth for them and speak to them. Meaning this beast will speak to them because people did not believe with certainty in Allah's ayat, in Allah's signs or verses. There is no sahih hadith letting us know what the dab or beast looks like. So it's up to your imagination. There, is this, um, there are these hadith about the head of the beast being a bull and the ears will be ears of an elephant and so forth. Like we have different body parts. But there is no authentic hadith about the beast. But what we do know is that it's a real beast. We also know that it will be able to speak to people and it will come out of the ground. Right? It's going to come out of the ground. And there is no evidence showing where it will come exactly. No sahih, no authentic evidence. <clears throat> what will the beast do? The beast will talk to people and it will brand people. Tell me, what does it mean to brand something? Tell me what it means to brand something. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, to put a mark on something. To put a mark on something. <laughs> Identification. So people usually do it with what? With like steel. Steel, metal. To, to what? To identify the animals or horses. Yeah, to identify animals or horses, what have you, right? You know, you're putting your mark on it so when your horse or camels go out, the people recognize that this is Muhammad or Ahmed's, you know, uh, animal. So this beast will brand people. And what about that? Abu Umama said that Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the beast will emerge and brown people on their noses then the people will, will mix until a man will buy a camel and he will be asked where did you buy that camel? and he will respond I got it from one of the branded people It says the people will continue to deal with each other in this manner for a while until one man will call out to another man saying, Oh believer, oh disbeliever. Like if you say, yo, or sir, or ma'am, when you're trying to get someone's attention, after the beast marks people, they will call it will become so normal. To recognize people by their belief or disbelief. <clears throat> That's it. It won't be like a racial slur or demeaning or anything. 
It's just common. So no. Just like you say, hello, excuse me, pardon me, sir, man. We say, this believer, come here. I can you help me with pick up this stuff? And then an the opposite, the person say, believer, you know, uh, could you give me directions? That's how it's going to be. So this animal will, beast will mark people. Thereafter, when Allah wills that the hour will, is coming, he will send a pleasant breeze that will take the souls of the believers. Why does Allah take the believer's soul before the hour begins? Meaning the last day begins. Yes, sir. Because it may be worse than what is happening right now. So, like, it's, he's taking their soul to make it easy. To take their souls to make it easy for them. Okay, go ahead. Because, like, maybe after hours, sorry. Maybe because there will be a lot of pain and he doesn't want the believers to go through that pain. Yes, sir. Good job. Yes, sir. Say okay. I think the reason why is because, uh, because he doesn't want the believers to have a very, very hard time. Right? And you know, he doesn't, uh, generally Allah doesn't want the believers to go through difficulties and things to be hard for them. Allah said, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُبَيِّنَ لَكُمْ وَيَهْدِيَكُمْ سُنَنَ الَّذِينَ مَنْ قَبْلِكُمْ وَيَتُوبَ عَلِيكُمْ Allah wants to clarify things to you, believers. And Allah wants to guide you to the ways that he guided the people before you. And he wants to forgive you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرَ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرَ Allah wants things to be easy for you, believers. He doesn't want things to be difficult for you. Right? Also, because the Day of Judgment is, the establishment of the Day of Judgment is the worst experience of the world. And just as you all said, Allah wants to save the believers from that experience. He doesn't want the believers to experience it. In fact, the worst of the creatures from the sons and daughters of Adam will experience the, the hour being established. The worst ones. The worst ones. So we ask Allah to keep us on the side of the believers. It was narrated by Abdullah ibn Amr. The Rasul, that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the Dajjal will appear among my ummah and he will stay for 40. And at that time Rasulullah said, I do not know if it is 40 days or 40 months or 40 years. But then of course Rasulullah told us that the first day is like what? A year. The second day is like a month. The third day is like a week and the rest of the day is like regular days. Good job. And then he said, I do not know, and now he says then, then Allah will send Isa ibn Maryam, who looks like Urwa ibn Mas'ud, and he will pursue him, meaning he will chase the Dajjal and he will kill him. Then the people will remain for seven years with no enmity between even two people. Two people will not even fight. Then Allah will send cool wind, a cool wind from the direction of Syria, and no one will be left on the face of the earth who has even an atom's weight of goodness or faith in their heart. This wind will cause them to die. It's going to take all of the believer's soul. Then he said, even if one of you were to enter into the heart of a mountain, which means like the cave in the deepest part of the mountain, that wind would come to you and cause you to die. Meaning no matter where you are, that wind is going to reach you. That breeze is going to come and take your soul. Then he said, there will be left the most evil people who will be as careless as birds are. They will not acknowledge good, nor will they denounce evil. He said, then the shaitan will appear to them and he will say, will you not listen to me? And they will say, what do you want us to do? He will say, I want 
Then Rasulullah said, He will command them to worship idols. What are idols? Yes. Idols, yes, sir. Stone and wood statues that people worship. Stone and wood statues or otherwise that people adopt as worship, as idols or gods to worship. That's an idol. He said they're going to, he's going to invite them to worship idols. He said, even though they're going to start worshiping idols again, they will have so much of this dunya. They're going to have, he says, ample provisions and a good life. Yeah, I mean, so much wealth, so much food, good, be beautiful life, fun and frolic and play and enjoyment. They're going to have all of that good stuff. Then the trumpet will be blown. And everyone who hears it will tilt his head to one side. The first one to hear it will be a man who is fixing the throw of his camels, or for his camels. He's going to be tending to his camels, and he will faint, and the people will follow him. Meaning they will faint as well. In addition to that, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu said that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Allah will send a wind from Yemen softer than silk, which will not leave a single person who has even the weight of a grain of faith in his heart. It will take his soul to him. Even the person that has the weight of a grain in his heart, it will take his soul. So this is the end of the beast. After this happens, basically, there is no more, I want to take my shahada. No more. You're going to be marked as a believer and a disbeliever. If you had believed already, that belief will continue. Those believers, they have kids, they're going to raise those kids as believers. But those disbelievers won't have a choice to raise their kids as believers. Halas, it's finished. Shouldn't we then appreciate the ability to say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. We should appreciate that, right? Because if they will come with people who wish they can say it. Allah said, Rubama, one second. Allah said, Rubama yawadu ladina kafaru lo kanu muslimin. It's quite possible that the disbelievers will wish they had been believers. Of course, that is in that part of the time of the world, but also on a day of judgment, the disbelievers, those who reject this faith that there is no deity but Allah and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, they will wish they had been believers. But we have, we have the script flipped because most of us wish we were like a lot like the disbelievers and the way that they live and their lifestyles, which is their, the way that they live, the freedom that they have. <laughs> Our kids go to college and they think, that, oh man, this is what college is? I was, my parents kept me from this my whole life. Yeah, so you realize that these people, no matter how high you get in this world, these people are miserable for the most part. They commit suicide even. You would have thought that all of that money and fame and all of that, these people can't even go anywhere without getting pictures taken. Look up the word paparazzi. Look up, could you imagine you get in a car and you get, taking a picture of you a thousand times before you get even to pull off? That's not happiness. But people think they see people with these fabulous gowns and dresses and they can buy what they want and go what they want. These people, uh, after you get so high as a, as a celebrity and a famous person, you wish you could just be by yourself for just a moment. You want people to just leave you alone and stop recognizing you so you can be a regular person. So don't think that fame and fortune is all that matters. No. What, all, the only thing that matters is a peace of mind. And what brings the greatest sense of a peace of mind? La ilaha illallah. Muhammad That reality. So the disbelievers will wish that they had believed. So don't wish to be in their place. May Allah save us. Yes. Anas. You had something? So you said that the, uh, the beast will mark the disbelievers and believers. Yes. So when the disbelievers, their children, they don't have an option to be believers? No, that's it. The time is over. 
that opportunity passed. Had those disbelievers believed, then yes. But they had to believe before. Like That's like Fir'aun. Fir'aun, he had ample opportunity, more than enough opportunity to believe, right? And then, not when he got into the water, not when he started drowning, no. He waited all the way as he is now becoming fully overcome by drowning. See? When the gharaq, this the drowning took effect of him, now he knows he's about to die. He waited until just the last moment. Then he wants to believe. Right? When he knew better the whole time. He knew. It's not like he was he wasn't an idiot. He was not a dummy. He understood that these signs are miracles. It's not magic. He knew that. He knew it from the jump, from the from the get-go, from the the introduction, right? He already knew it. But then he wanted to wage war against it. Then he kept going and kept going and kept going. So you're talking about somebody like that, that the people can see the signs. That's also it makes it important for us to go out and be Muslims. I'm, I'm saying like even before going out and spreading Islam, we have to go out and be what? Go out and do what? Be Muslims. Just be Muslim. When you're at home, be a Muslim. Be, I, mean, I have to be a Muslim at home. I have to be a Muslim with my children. I have to be a Muslim when I come to the masjid. Right? It's like, I want you to understand it and I want to remind myself, we have to step into a mindset that being a Muslim means that we have to behave a certain way. We have to say things in a certain way. or certain things we should not say. We have to have certain feelings that's going on about one another. Certain feelings, positive feelings about Allah and His Messenger. Right? We have to go through this because we, we lose track of things, you know, we just get used to things, we pray and then Ramadan comes, we fast and Jumu'ah comes and we come for Jumu'ah. But we forget to be disciplined. We forget that this is really something to be a Muslim. Did you finish your question, Max? Go ahead. Well, what I was asking is that, like, after, after that, people will keep living, right? They'll yes. They'll keep going. So once, once the dis, well, once like a disbeliever, he has a child. That child, it's, he cannot, he doesn't have a chance. Unfortunately, no. He doesn't have a chance to believe because his parents. I mean, he won't have a chance to believe because it is. Yeah, I mean, the line has been drawn. That does not mean you don't think that they had they had if they would have had the chance they would have believed. No. Those people had the chance they would have disbelieved. You know what I'm saying? If Allah were to create all of the children of Adam and all of the jinns and just put people in paradise and put people in hell, the people in paradise would be really happy about that. But the people in hell would be wondering, what did I do to wind up here? Imagine if Allah said to them, you disbelieved. And they're going to say, I wasn't given a chance. That's what they're going to say. I wasn't given a chance. I didn't receive a revelation. I didn't hear a messenger. Right? So, to not give them that argument on the Day of Judgment, Allah gave everybody what? A chance. Equal chance. Equal, equal opportunity. And they still decided not to. In fact, Allah said that the people on the day of judgment will say, Oh Allah, send us back and we'll believe. And Allah said, No. وَلَوْرُدُّ لَعَادُوا لِمَا نُهُوا عَنْهُ Even if they were put on earth again, and the whole concept of the day of judgment was erased, yani after you experienced it, and you say, Ya Allah, send me, send me back. Allah said, if I would have sent you back, and the concept of the day of judgment would happen, would have been erased, you would have gone right back to disbelief again. This means that no matter what, this individual would have disbelieved. And it's, that's how deep it is. You're wondering, oh, what is up? That's how people are. Allah gives everybody a chance so that no one has an excuse on the Day of Judgment. Because Rasulullah said, لا أحد أحب إليه العذر من الله. No one loves an excuse more than Allah. No one loves an excuse more than Allah. Allah loves excuses. So He prepares us and He does things and He gives us concessions in this deen when there's an excuse. For example, when you, can, when you can't pray standing, how do you pray? Sitting. And if you can't pray sitting, how do you pray? Lying down and so forth. 
And, um, and if you if you miss the prayer because you were asleep or you forgot, then you don't get the sin of abandoning prayer. You can just pray when you get up or pray when you remember. So there's no sin on you, right? But that's God <coughs> loves this. He loves to give us, make it easy for us. A person who is sick and can't fast, Allah says, don't fast. Just feed 30 people. Allah loves to give us chances. He loves it. But these people, no matter how many chances you give them, they will never believe. Uh, that's why their, even their children will not, not be given that chance. Yes, sir. And then I'm coming to you. Yes. No, I think uh, this question, referring to this question is... Did I answer your question? I mean, what? Are you sure? I can go back. Okay, go ahead. So, disbelievers' children, uh -huh. they're, um, uh, they don't, they're innocent. Yeah, of course they're innocent. They considered as innocent? children. So... Yeah, they're innocent as children. Go ahead. But would they become disbeliever because they're children of disbeliever? The issue is that their choices will be the same choices as their parents. You gotta remember something. Like that child who was killed by Khidr. Child killed by Khidr. You have a boy, a child. Killed by who? Khidr. Khidr was with Musa. And Moses said, You killed a child. He didn't kill anybody. And then Khidr explained to him, if he had lived, he would have tired his parents out with oppression and disbelief. So Allah wanted to save those two believing parents from this child, so he had his life taken for them. And of course, this is something that Allah communicated to Khidr. That is, you go out and you go kill again, no, don't do that. We are Muslims. Right? Just, just to... <coughs> Make that clear. But we have to understand that those people who are destined to disbelieve and their choices are choices of disbelief. And the other needs to be, the destiny concept of destiny needs to be sat down and, and discussed and understood. Because it's something that people get, trip, get tripped up in a little bit. It can be quite confusing. But if we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows all things and He has, has the power over all things, it's just like him creating humans and creating jinns, putting some of them in a hellfire and putting some of them in paradise. It's just like that. He already knew. But he gave everybody a chance instead, and everyone did the actions that led them to paradise or hellfire. What are some of the actions of disbelievers? Think about it. Disbeliever might take someone's life. Right? Like Fir'aun did. Use Fir'aun as an example. Didn't he take the lives of the children of Israel? He killed their boys and left their daughters alive. He enslaved them and he claimed that he is God. Right? He did these things. And these are decisions that he made. And before that he earned the hellfire. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew exactly what was going to happen. But that does not put Allah at fault because he gave him a chance. He sent him Moses, and he saw the signs, and he saw everything. And he even believed. Allah said that he knew. He was certain about these signs. There was no doubt about it. But he still was so arrogant. He was still what? So arrogant that he did not want to accept. So Allah gave him what he deserved. Excuse yes, sir. One second. I think the children topic is pretty hot right now. But, uh, based off of that... Uh, until you mature or you decide for yourself, uh, if you call somebody like Dr. Zakir or uh, some of these other scholars, they say until you mature before that when you're born you're a Muslim, and then when you decide for yourself is when you want to be a Christian or something else, that's when you convert it to another religion, and that's when you're held accountable. Is it, uh, is it correct to assume, or what is your take on if you're not mature, for example, uh, and you, dis uh, you pass away as a children? You know, there's no uh, you know accountability for them. Are you assuming Muslim then or not? Like, okay, so let's clarify the issue of children being Muslims until they accept Judaism or Christianity or otherwise. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Kullum kullu maulud yulad wa al-fitr." Every child that is born is born upon a default setting. I only translate it to default setting because that's what we can relate to. So you know, if you take a device and you press the reset button on the device. You usually got to take something really thin and dig in there, and it's going to reset that device to its factory settings. Same thing for your phone. You can reset your 
factory setting. So that's a default setting that every child is born on. When guidance comes to this child, he will accept it. No problem. I was a child, 12 years old, when I accepted Islam. So when guidance comes to this child, he will accept it. Especially if Allah, yani, if Allah did destined for this person to be safe, and he a believer. That's the origin. That's the origin. Scholars differ about the, the children who are disbelievers and when they die, what they become. Some say they become the boys or those young, uh, that young group of people that serve the people of Jannah. And some people say other things. But the hadith that is also authentic. Rasulullah said, Allah, Allah, Allah knows best what they would have done. So Allah is up in the air. Some of them will be tested. Yani if, the, if you say, well, they'll be tested on the Day of Judgment, then they'll be tested on the Day of Judgment, and some of them will pass that test, and others will not pass. Those who will pass would have believed, and those who do not pass that test would not have believed no matter what. Similar to the person who was insane his whole life, a person who never heard about prophets or revelation, they lived in a jungle somewhere, they never had the idea, they didn't have television, they had nothing. This person also will be tested on the Day of Judgment and various others. Anyone who has this excuse will be tested. If they follow Allah's command, they will enter paradise. If they disobey Allah, then that's worse than disobeying a messenger. I mean, Allah spoke right to you and he said, will you listen to me? You said yes. He commanded. And some of the ahadith say that Allah will tell the hellfire to present its necks. To present itself and he will tell the people to throw themselves inside. Those of them who jump in, it will be cool and safe for them. And those of them who, did, who hesitate and do not, then they will be thrown in there forever. It means those who jumped in would have believed, and those who hesitated and didn't listen to Allah's command, then they would not have believed no matter what signs they saw, they would have seen. So the, basically, let me sum that up. Allah knows best about the children who die before puberty. Where they're going to go, Allah is best, Allah may test them and so forth. But to say that they're just Muslims is also incorrect. So we have to be in between the two. Allah knows best what's going to happen, and uh, they, are, they, are, they do have a default setting. Yes, sir, one second. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, how about like, if they're like a one year old baby, they don't even know anything, like, and the day of judgment happens, are they going to go to Jahannam still? Again, Allah knows best. <laughs> Again, Allah knows best. Maybe. And Allah will test them. If they pass the test, they're going to Jannah. If Allah tests them and they fail the test, then they're going to the fire. That's what this is, a test. We either pass or we fail. That's really what it is. Yes, sir. I think it's creating a, a, a confusing si in a situation because the children, adults, grown-up, parents, everybody. Back to the question of the boy of Khidr al-Islam. Yes. So, we are on a kufra, that he will be doing oppression and will be doing kufra. Yes, and he will tire his so exhaustion. That's right. That's right. Only Allah knows if he leaves, then he will do this thing. That's right. He will be the oppressor and he will be a kufr. Exactly. But the point is this but the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he comes to his life, so the explanation is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give this righteous parents better children. That's right. Allah but understand. concerning this boy, Here's the catch, I think everybody's saying. That he didn't get a chance. Yes, he will do. And nobody knows except Allah. He'll be evil guy. But till now, he's innocent. That's why being a prophet, Musa, he said that, how come he did it? He's an innocent boy. That's right. He didn't practice, implement the dirty things yet. Right. And so I heard some explanations. That Allah blessed the parents, at the same time, blessed the little kid, okay. because he didn't do the dirty thing, so he would go to Jannah. Okay. Well, I never, uh, I never came, I, I haven't come across that explanation, I, but I, I mean, at the end of the day, Allah knows best. Yeah. He will definitely uh, give everyone a fair shot to enter Jannah. If he does not give them a fair sh I mean, the shot, the full test here, he's going <laughs> to test them on the Day of Judgment. And then no one will have any excuse because they only have an option to obey Allah directly or disobey Allah directly. There's no vagueness, there's no confusion, there's nothing. It's a correct command, and they know exactly who's talking to them. 
if if that's the case, then that's the case. I haven't come across it myself. Yes, sir. Now come to you. Yes. Sir. So there are actually people alive that have no absolute faith in Allah. Yes, there are some people alive that don't have any faith in Allah, and there are some people alive that haven't heard of the concept of revelation, what a messenger is. You know what I mean? They call people a fetra, which means they come between prophets, between the time of prophets, but they didn't get a chance to learn anything about this deen and all of that stuff. So they will be given a fair shot to obey or disobey. Yes, sir. Uh, back to the topic, so the, uh, the soft uh, breeze, the fact that it's soft breeze that is going to pass through all the movements yes. and take their soul. Is that, uh, is that an indication that they are not going to go through the hardship of Sakat and or that they can give less? That's a good question. Our brother asked uh, that soft breeze that comes and takes the souls of the believers, is that an indication that they do not go through the pangs and difficulties of death? Allah, I do not know. I do not know if that indicates that they will suffer any pain of death or not. Uh, we hope that Allah will make our death easy. Aisha radiallahu anha said that I'm not disappointed or upset that anyone suffers the pains of death because I saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa himself suffering the pain of death. So I'm not, I don't mind that anyone else suffers it because I saw him suffering, basically. Wallahu alam, if that breeze will indicate an easy death or not, wallahu alam. Yes, sir, in the back, Ma'ad. I'm sorry, I can hardly hear you. Could you raise your voice? You know how there are many religions? Yes. How do we know this is the right religion? That's a wonderful question. Our brother said, you know that there are many religions. How do we know for sure that this is the right religion? Okay. Every prophet, Ma'ad, every prophet came with their miracle. Right? Miracle. Some of the miracles of Moses is that he threw a staff down and it came, became a snake, right? <coughs> that he brought his hand out of his sleeve or his shirt and it was shining. That he was directly communicating with Allah, right? And many other things. He was given the Torah, many things. Jesus would call upon a person and that person would be alive, come alive. Jesus would take the figure of a bird and breathe into the figure and it will come alive, right? These are signs. The miracle of this ummah, the miracle of this nation after Muhammad is the Quran itself. That's the miracle. We're going to say, well, how is it the miracle? The response is you have to read it. You have to do what? <coughs> read it. You know that the, this religion is the religion to follow if you contemplate the Qur'an. <coughs> if you study the Qur'an, you will see it clear as day. There's no doubt about it. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there are authentic narrations about Dala'il al-Nubuwa, evidences for the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Scholars have written books on that. But just to take it to the basic, Allah says, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ مِمَّا نَزَّلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَدِّنَا فَأْتُوا بِصُورَةٍ مِنْ مِثْلِهِ If you guys have any doubt about what we have revealed to our servant Muhammad, meaning the Qur'an, if you have any doubt about the Qur'an, then bring one surah, one chapter like it, and call on all of your Witnesses beside Allah if you are able to do so. If you are truthful. Then Allah said, and if you are unable to produce one surah, and you will never be able to do it, then protect yourselves from the fire that is fueled by men and stones. It has been prepared for those who reject faith. So Allah is challenging us directly that if you have any doubt about it, just produce a surah like one of these surahs. But in order to, for you to produce a surah like the Quran, don't you have to study don't you have to contemplate it? And the beautiful thing about the Qur'an is like an ocean with no shore and an ocean with no floor. Think about it like that. It's an ocean with no shore and an ocean with no floor. The more you study it, the awesome, the more it appeals to you. And the, the more beauty you see out of it. So my friend Mu'ab, my suggestion is read the Qur'an for you. Yani since you speak English for the most part, you probably know some Arabic too. 
Read the Quran in English and tell me what you think about it. Okay? Can we do that? No. Did someone have? Did I ask? Him? Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Sorry. Uh, what is? Which one of the first comes? The smoke or the sound right from the west? Yeah, the, so the scholars tried their best to come up with the order, but there's no narration indicating the order itself. So it could be that the smoke comes after the sun rising from the west, and it could be also that the beast comes after the sun rising from the west. In fact, I've heard that as, an, as a position of some scholars, that the beast, the sun rises from the west, and then the beast comes out, and then the smoke. But Allah knows best because Rasulullah didn't say it in a, and tell us a particular order. for Allah. Yes, sir. Okay, so related to this is like related to Mohammed's question. Okay. Um, how do we know, like, you know, how the Quran is like copied and then it's translated? How do we know that we, like, the people who printed it, did not change it? Good job. How do we know that the people who didn't print, who printed the Quran, didn't change it? Well, Allah said in the Quran, "Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidun." That I have revealed this. Vikr, this reminder, and I am going to protect it. So Allah swore that He is going to do what? Protect it. A person who memorizes the Quran is called a Qari, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the ways to memorize the Quran, actually the best way, is to take it as a senad, take a chain of or license of memorizing the Quran. And when you take the license from memorizing the, of memorizing the Quran, you learned it from your teacher who learned from his teacher who learned from their teacher who learned all the way up to the Sahaba. So you have a chain of transmitters, people who are relating the Quran. And each of you learned from the previous, and you have the same, yani mean the same knowledge of the Quran, that, that chain that you have. In addition to that, if you call someone in Australia right now and tell them to turn to a particular verse or a particular surah, I promise you that surah is going to be the same as they have it. If you call someone in Russia, if you call someone in New Zealand, or wherever else you want to call someone, they're going to have the same. And so forth. So keep that in mind. The Quran is not like the other books that have to be translated and new editions have to become we don't need a new edition for the Quran. The Quran is the Quran, which is the Arabic Quran, and anything else is a translation. The English, the uh, Urdu, the Turkish, all of these are translations of the Quran. The Quran itself is still intact. So what I want you to do is I want you to read the translation of the Quran. Amen? And I want all of you Especially our youngsters, please, please read the translation of the Quran. I know you read one day, you read, uh, you know, Harry Potter, you probably read the whole series, those big, thick books. And you've read, you've, yeah, he's read it. And many other books, my question is also read the Quran. Parents, please, do us a favor. Do the Imams a favor. As our brother was complaining earlier, that why don't why do parents feel like or think that they have to bring their kids to the masjid to be Islamized? Islamized or made Muslims or made, give them the care. He said it has to start at home. I mean, we bring our kids to Sunday school sometimes and we feel like the kids want to learn about Islam. My brother, my sister, the kids are supposed to learn about Islam at home. And then we're supposed to come, when you bring them here, then it's my job to further them answer their questions that you couldn't answer, and so forth. Develop a relationship. I'm supposed to take what they already have further. But they've spent their whole lives up on Barney and Sesame Street, and then they've evolved to, uh, you know, Pokemon and others. They've just, they, that's, what you, that's what they're learning. And they watch so many Disney movies that they hate themselves. Well, no, I mean, this is the reality. They go from movie to movie to movie to movie. Every time you go out, you're running them to the theaters. What are you doing? You're, you're creating something and that child will behave in a certain way that now when he comes here or she comes here I have to deal with it. I have to answer their questions and so forth but it's their tarbiya, their being raised should start at home please so if you're not reading the translation sit down with your kid and let them read to you the translation of the Quran read with them, make it fun, give them prizes it is the reading of the translation of the Quran that got me here where I am, and I'll take one more question. Uh, 
Uh, I'm going back to uh, the question of Brother Mark. Just like for the, uh, for the uh, clarification. Just if you allow me, just a little bit elaboration about what he said. Okay. About the different religion. Allah uh, Wa'ala. All the prophets, when they when they admitted what their religion, they said to be Islam. I don't recall the ayat, but more, all of them, when they said, like, I know the Muslim, why am I a Muslim? So the fact, actually, that there's the religions that be descended on prophets, Allah, and it's not like it's misunderstood, because all of them became Islam as a religion. However, there's different books, like, there's different books being descended on them, but the fact that they are, we have, we are calling like Christianity or Judaism, it's kind of something like being made later on. But however, it's not a religion. <coughs> they themselves that their religion is Good. So let me uh, sum up what our brother Abu Anas said. That prophets were sent to various people, and those prophets were given prophets were given various books and revelations. And when it was called Christianity or Judaism or otherwise, it was called that. But the origin of it was Islam. People believing that there was one God and that messenger is a messenger. So yes, people then went on and invented many religions. You can invent a religion anytime. I mean, there's so many been invented even in America. You know, go ahead and research the religions that are invented in America. But the reality is all of the prophets called to la ilaha illallah, that there is no God but Allah, and they taught their people just that. Whatever people then adopted after that is their problem. It has nothing to do with the prophets. And any religion that anyone made up in the process has nothing to do with Allah and His messengers. We are to follow and we are to listen and obey. We ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to understand these wonderful things about our religion. We hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives certainty to our kids and help them to continue to come and ask these really good questions so that they can go back and they can read the Qur'an and they can go back, they can continue to ask questions and continue to ask questions and their iman will develop. And we would ask our kids, inshallah, next time, please don't sit in that niche over there in that corner. We want you to come out and, and spread amongst the rest of the adults here. May Allah make it easy for you. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala